Justinian I. Justinian I, traditionally known as Justinian the Great and also Saint Justinian the Great in the Eastern Orthodox Church, was the Eastern Roman Emperor from 527 to 565. During his reign, Justinian sought to revive the empire's greatness and reconquer the lost western half of the historical Roman Empire. Justinian's rule constitutes a distinct epoch in the history of the later Roman Empire and his reign is marked by the ambitious but only partly realized Renovatio Imperii, or Restoration of the Empire. Because of his restoration activities, Justinian has sometimes been known as the last Roman in mid-20th century historiography. This ambition was expressed by the partial recovery of the territories of the defunct Western Roman Empire. His general, Belisarius, swiftly conquered the Vandal Kingdom in North Africa. Subsequently, Belisarius, Narses, and other generals conquered the Ostrogothic Kingdom, restoring Dalmatia, Sicily, Italy, and Rome to the Empire after more than half a century of rule by the Ostrogoths. The prefect Librius reclaimed the south of the Iberian Peninsula, establishing the province of Spania. These campaigns re-established Roman control over the western Mediterranean, increasing the Empire's annual revenue by over a million solidi. During his reign, Justinian also subdued the Zaini, a people on the east coast of the Black Sea that had never been under Roman rule before. He engaged the Sassanian Empire in the east during Kavid I's reign, and later again during Khosro I's, this second conflict was partially initiated due to his ambitions in the west. A still more resonant aspect of his legacy was the uniform rewriting of Roman law, the Corpus Juris Civilis, which is still the basis of civil law in many modern states. His reign also marked a blossoming of Byzantine culture, and his building program yielded such masterpieces as the Church of Hagia Sophia. Justinian was born in Taurisum, Dardaniat, around 482. A native speaker of Latin, he came from a peasant family believed to have been of Illyro-Roman or Thraco-Roman origins. The cognomen Iustinianus, which he took later, is indicative of adoption by his uncle Justin. During his reign, he founded Justin Iana Prima not far from his birthplace, which today is in southeast Serbia. His mother was Vigilantia, the sister of Justin. Justin, who was in the Imperial Guard before he became Emperor, adopted Justinian, brought him to Constantinople, and ensured the boy's education. As a result, Justinian was well educated in jurisprudence, theology, and Roman history. Justinian served for some time with the excavators but the details of his early career are unknown. Chronicler John Malalas, who lived during the reign of Justinian, tells of his appearance that he was short, fair-skinned, curly-haired, round-faced and handsome. Another contemporary chronicler, Procopius, compares Justinian's appearance to that of tyrannical Emperor Domitian, although this is probably slander. When Emperor Anastasius died in 518, Justin was proclaimed the new emperor, with significant help from Justinian. During Justin's reign, Justinian was the emperor's close confidant. Justinian showed much ambition, and it has been thought that he was functioning as virtual regent long before Justin made him associate emperor on April 1, 527, although there is no conclusive evidence of this. As Justin became senile near the end of his reign, Justinian became the de facto ruler. Justinian was appointed consul in 521 and later commander of the Army of the East. Upon Justin's death on August 1, 527, Justinian became the sole sovereign. As a ruler, Justinian showed great energy. He was known as the emperor who never sleeps on account of his work habits. Nevertheless, he seems to have been amiable and easy to approach. Around 525, he married his mistress, Theodora, in Constantinople. She was by profession a courtesan and some 20 years his junior. In earlier times, Justinian could not have married her owing to her class, but his uncle, Emperor Justin I, had passed a law allowing intermarriage between social classes. Theodora would become very influential in the politics of the empire, and later emperors would follow Justinian's precedent in marrying outside the aristocratic class. The marriage caused a scandal, 
but Theodora would prove to be a shrewd judge of character and Justinian's greatest supporter. Other talented individuals included Tribonian, his legal adviser, Peter the Patrician, the diplomat and longtime head of the palace bureaucracy, Justinian's finance ministers John the Cappadocian and Peter Barzemes, who managed to collect taxes more efficiently than any before, thereby funding Justinian's wars, and finally, his prodigiously talented generals, Belisarius and Narses. Justinian's rule was not universally popular, early in his reign he nearly lost his throne during the Nica riots, and a conspiracy against the emperor's life by dissatisfied businessmen was discovered as late as 562. Justinian was struck by the plague in the early 540s but recovered. Theodora died in 548 at a relatively young age, possibly of cancer, Justinian outlived her by nearly 20 years. Justinian, who had always had a keen interest in theological matters and actively participated in debates on Christian doctrine, became even more devoted to religion during the later years of his life. When he died on November 14, 565, he left no children, though his wife Theodora had given birth to a stillborn son several years into his reign. He was succeeded by Justin II, who was the son of his sister Vigilantia and married to Sophia, the niece of Empress Theodora. Justinian's body was entombed in a specially built mausoleum in the Church of the Holy Apostles until it was desecrated and robbed during the pillage of the city in 1204 by the Latin states of the Fourth Crusade. Justinian achieved lasting fame through his judicial reforms, particularly through the complete revision of all Roman law, something that had not previously been attempted. The total of Justinian's legislature is known today as the Corpus Juris Civilis. It consists of the Codex Iustinianus, the Digesta, or Pandecti, the Institutions, and the Novelli. Early in his reign, Justinian appointed the Quaestor Tribonian to oversee this task. The first draft of the Codex Iustinianus, a codification of imperial constitutions from the 2nd century onward, was issued on April 7, 529. It was followed by the Digesta, a compilation of older legal texts, in 533, and by the Institutions, a textbook explaining the principles of law. The Novelli, a collection of new laws issued during Justinian's reign, supplements the corpus. As opposed to the rest of the corpus, the Novelli appeared in Greek, the common language of the Eastern Empire. The corpus forms the basis of Latin jurisprudence and, for historians, provides a valuable insight into the concerns and activities of the later Roman Empire. As a collection it gathers together the many sources in which the leges and the other rules were expressed or published, proper laws, senatorial consults, imperial decrees, case law, and jurists' opinions and interpretations. Tribonian's Code ensured the survival of Roman law. It formed the basis of later Byzantine law as expressed in the Basilica of Basil I and Leo VI the Wise. The only western province where the Justinianic Code was introduced was Italy, from where it was to pass to Western Europe in the 12th century and become the basis of much European law code. It eventually passed to Eastern Europe where it appeared in Slavic editions, and it also passed on to Russia. It remains influential to this day. He passed laws to protect prostitutes from exploitation and women from being forced into prostitution. Rapists were treated severely. Further, by his policies, women charged with major crimes should be guarded by other women to prevent sexual abuse, if a woman was widowed, her dowry should be returned, and a husband could not take on a major debt without his wife giving her consent twice. Justinian's habit of choosing efficient, but unpopular advisers nearly cost him his throne early in his reign. In January 532, partisans of the chariot racing factions in Constantinople, normally rivals, united against Justinian in a revolt that has become known as the Nica riots. They forced him to dismiss Tribonian and two of his other ministers, and then attempted to overthrow Justinian himself and replace him with the senator Hypatius, who was a nephew of the late emperor Anastasius. While the crowd was rioting in the streets, Justinian considered fleeing the capital by sea, but eventually decided to stay, apparently on the prompting of Theodora, who refused to leave. In the next two days, 
he ordered the brutal suppression of the riots by his generals Belisarius and Mundus. Procopius relates that 30,000 unarmed civilians were killed in the Hippodrome. On Theodora's insistence, and apparently against his own judgment, Justinian had Anastasius' nephews executed. The destruction that took place during the revolt provided Justinian with an opportunity to tie his name to a series of splendid new buildings, most notably the architectural innovation of the domed Hagia Sophia. One of the most spectacular features of Justinian's reign was the recovery of large stretches of land around the western Mediterranean basin that had slipped out of imperial control in the 5th century. As a Christian Roman emperor, Justinian considered it his divine duty to restore the Roman Empire to its ancient boundaries. Although he never personally took part in military campaigns, he boasted of his successes in the prefaces to his laws and had them commemorated in art. The reconquests were in large part carried out by his general Belisarius. From his uncle, Justinian inherited ongoing hostilities with the Sassanid Empire. In 530 the Persian forces suffered a double defeat at Dara and Sadala, but the next year saw the defeat of Roman forces under Belisarius near Colonicum. Justinian then tried to make alliance with the Aksumites of Ethiopia and the Hymiarites of Yemen against the Persians, but this failed. When King Kavadai of Persia died, Justinian concluded an eternal peace with his successor Khosrau I. Having thus secured his eastern frontier, Justinian turned his attention to the west, where Germanic kingdoms had been established in the territories of the former Western Roman Empire. The first of the Western kingdoms Justinian attacked was that of the Vandals in North Africa. King Hild Eric, who had maintained good relations with Justinian and the North African Catholic clergy, had been overthrown by his cousin Gelimer in 530 AD imprisoned, the deposed king appealed to Justinian. In 533, Belisarius sailed to Africa with a fleet of 92 dramons, escorting 500 transports carrying an army of about 15,000 men, as well as a number of barbarian troops. They landed at Cape Veda in modern Tunisia. They defeated the Vandals, who were caught completely off guard, at Ad Decimum on September 14, 533 and Trichomerum in December, Belisarius took Carthage. King Gelimer fled to Mount Papua in Numidia, but surrendered the next spring. He was taken to Constantinople, where he was paraded in a triumph. Sardinia and Corsica, the Balearic Islands, and the stronghold Septum Fratra near Gibraltar were recovered in the same campaign. In this war, the contemporary Procopius remarks that Africa was so entirely dispeopled, that a person might travel several days without meeting a human being, and he adds, it is no exaggeration to say, that in the course of the war five million perished by the sword and famine and pestilence. An African prefecture, centered in Carthage, was established in April 534, but it would teeter on the brink of collapse during the next 15 years, amidst warfare with the Moors and military mutinies. The area was not completely pacified until 548, but remained peaceful thereafter and enjoyed a measure of prosperity. The recovery of Africa cost the empire about 100,000 pounds of gold. As in Africa, dynastic struggles in Ostrogothic Italy provided an opportunity for intervention. The young king Athalaric had died on October 2, 534, and a usurper, Theodohad, had imprisoned Queen Amalasuntha, Theodoric's daughter and mother of Athalaric, on the island of Martana in Lake Bolsena, where he had her assassinated in 535. Thereupon Belisarius, with 7,500 men, invaded Sicily and advanced into Italy, sacking Naples and capturing Rome on December 9, 536. By that time Theodohad had been deposed by the Ostrogothic army, who had elected Vitigius as their new king. He gathered a large army and besieged Rome from February 537 to March 538 without being able to retake the city. Justinian sent another general, Narses, to Italy, but tensions between Narses and Belisarius hampered the progress of the campaign. Milan was taken, but was soon recaptured and razed by the Ostrogoths. Justinian recalled Narses in 539. By then the military situation had turned in favor of the Romans, and in 540 Belisarius reached the Ostrogothic capital Ravenna. 
there he was offered the title of Western Roman Emperor by the Ostrogoths at the same time that envoys of Justinian were arriving to negotiate a peace that would leave the region north of the Po River in Gothic hands. Belisarius feigned acceptance of the offer, entered the city in May 540, and reclaimed it for the empire. Then, having been recalled by Justinian, Belisarius returned to Constantinople, taking the captured Vitigius and his wife Matasuntha with him. Belisarius had been recalled in the face of renewed hostilities by the Persians. Following a revolt against the empire in Armenia in the late 530s and possibly motivated by the pleas of Ostrogothic ambassadors, King Khosrau I broke the eternal peace and invaded Roman territory in the spring of 540. He first sacked Baroea and then Antioch, besieged Darus, and then went on to attack the small but strategically significant satellite kingdom of Lazica near the Black Sea, exacting tribute from the towns he passed along his way. He forced Justinian I to pay him 5,000 pounds of gold, plus 500 pounds of gold more each year. Belisarius arrived in the east in 541, but after some success, was again recalled to Constantinople in 542. The reasons for his withdrawal are not known, but it may have been instigated by rumors of his disloyalty reaching the court. The outbreak of the plague caused a lull in the fighting during the year 543. The following year Khosrau defeated a Byzantine army of 30,000 men, but unsuccessfully besieged the major city of Edessa. Both parties made little headway, and in 545 a truce was agreed upon for the southern part of the Roman-Persian frontier. After that the Lazic War in the north continued for several years, until a second truce in 557, followed by a 50 years peace in 562. Under its terms, the Persians agreed to abandon Lazica in exchange for an annual tribute of 400 or 500 pounds of gold to be paid by the Romans. While military efforts were directed to the east, the situation in Italy took a turn for the worse. Under their respective kings Ildibat and Irarik and especially Totila, the Ostrogoths made quick gains. After a victory at Faenza in 542, they reconquered the major cities of southern Italy and soon held almost the entire Italian peninsula. Belisarius was sent back to Italy late in 544 but lacked sufficient troops and supplies. Making no headway, he was relieved of his command in 548. Belisarius succeeded in defeating a Gothic fleet of 200 ships. During this period the city of Rome changed hands three more times, first taken and depopulated by the Ostrogoths in December 546, then reconquered by the Byzantines in 547, and then again by the Goths in January 550. Totila also plundered Sicily and attacked Greek coastlines. Finally, Justinian dispatched a force of approximately 35,000 men under the command of Narses. The army reached Ravenna in June 552 and defeated the Ostrogoths decisively within a month at the Battle of Bustagalorum in the Apennines, where Totila was slain. After a second battle at Mons Lactarius in October that year, the resistance of the Ostrogoths was finally broken. In 554, a large-scale Frankish invasion was defeated at Caesilinum, and Italy was secured for the empire, though it would take Narses several years to reduce the remaining Gothic strongholds. At the end of the war, Italy was garrisoned with an army of 16,000 men. The recovery of Italy cost the empire about 300,000 pounds of gold. Procopius estimated the loss of the Goths at 15,000,000,000. In addition to the other conquests, the empire established a presence in Visigothic Hispania, when the usurper Athanagild requested assistance in his rebellion against King Agila I. In 552, Justinian dispatched a force of 2,000 men, according to the historian Jordans, this army was led by the octogenarian Librius. The Byzantines took Cartagena and other cities on the southeastern coast and founded the new province of Spania before being checked by their former ally Athanagild, who had by now become king. This campaign marked the apogee of Byzantine expansion. During Justinian's reign, the Balkans suffered from several incursions by the Turkic and Slavic peoples who lived north of the Danube. Here, Justinian resorted mainly to a combination of diplomacy and a system of defensive works. 
In 559 a particularly dangerous invasion of Sklavinoi and Kutrigurs under their Khan's Abergan threatened Constantinople, but they were repulsed by the aged general Belisarius. Justinian's ambition to restore the Roman Empire to its former glory was only partly realized. In the West, the brilliant early military successes of the 530s were followed by years of stagnation. The dragging war with the Goths was a disaster for Italy, even though its long-lasting effects may have been less severe than is sometimes thought. The heavy taxes that the administration imposed upon its population were deeply resented. The final victory in Italy and the conquest of Africa and the coast of southern Hispania significantly enlarged the area over which the empire could project its power and eliminated all naval threats to the empire. Despite losing much of Italy soon after Justinian's death, the empire retained several important cities, including Rome, Naples, and Ravenna, leaving the Lombards as a regional threat. The newly founded province of Spania kept the Visigoths as a threat to Hispania alone and not to the western Mediterranean and Africa. Events of the later years of the reign showed that Constantinople itself was not safe from barbarian incursions from the north and even the relatively benevolent historian Menander Protector felt the need to attribute the emperor's failure to protect the capital to the weakness of his body in his old age. In his efforts to renew the Roman Empire, Justinian dangerously stretched its resources while failing to take into account the changed realities of 6th century Europe. Justinian saw the orthodoxy of his empire threatened by diverging religious currents, especially monophysitism which had many adherents in the eastern provinces of Syria and Egypt. Monophysite doctrine, which maintains that Jesus Christ had one divine nature or a synthesis of a divine and human nature, had been condemned as a heresy by the Council of Chalcedon in 451, and the tolerant policies towards monophysitism of Zeno and Anastasius I had been a source of tension in the relationship with the bishops of Rome. Justin reversed this trend and confirmed the Chalcedonian doctrine openly condemning the Monophysites. Justinian, who continued this policy, tried to impose religious unity on his subjects by forcing them to accept doctrinal compromises that might appeal to all parties, a policy that proved unsuccessful as he satisfied none of them. Near the end of his life, Justinian became ever more inclined towards the Monophysite doctrine, especially in the form of Aphthartodicetism, but he died before being able to issue any legislation. The Empress Theodora sympathized with the Monophysites and is said to have been a constant source of pro-Monophysite intrigues at the court in Constantinople in the earlier years. In the course of his reign, Justinian, who had a genuine interest in matters of theology, authored a small number of theological treatises. As in his secular administration, despotism appeared also in the emperor's ecclesiastical policy. He regulated everything, both in religion and in law. At the very beginning of his reign, he deemed it proper to promulgate by law the Church's belief in the Trinity and the Incarnation, and to threaten all heretics with the appropriate penalties, whereas he subsequently declared that he intended to deprive all disturbers of orthodoxy of the opportunity for such offence by due process of law. He made the Nisano Constantinopolitan Creed the sole symbol of the Church and accorded legal force to the canons of the four ecumenical councils. The bishops in attendance at the Second Council of Constantinople in 553 recognized that nothing could be done in the church contrary to the emperor's will and command, while, on his side, the emperor, in the case of the patriarch Anthimus, reinforced the ban of the church with temporal proscription. Justinian protected the purity of the church by suppressing heretics. He neglected no opportunity to secure the rights of the church and clergy, and to protect and extend monasticism. He granted the monks the right to inherit property from private citizens and the right to receive solemnia, or annual gifts, from the imperial treasury or from the taxes of certain provinces and he prohibited lay confiscation of monastic estates. Although the despotic character of his measures is contrary to modern sensibilities, he was indeed a nursing father of the church. Both the Codex and the Novelli contain many enactments regarding donations, foundations, and the administration of ecclesiastical property, election and rights of bishops, priests, and abbots, monastic life, residential obligations of the clergy, conduct of divine service, episcopal jurisdiction, etc. Justinian also rebuilt the Church of Hagia Sophia, 
the original site having been destroyed during the Nica riots. The new Hagia Sophia, with its numerous chapels and shrines, gilded octagonal dome, and mosaics, became the center and most visible monument of Eastern Orthodoxy in Constantinople. From the middle of the 5th century onward, increasingly arduous tasks confronted the emperors of the East in ecclesiastical matters. Justinian entered the arena of ecclesiastical statecraft shortly after his uncle's accession in 518, and put an end to the Acacian Schism. Previous emperors had tried to alleviate theological conflicts by declarations that demphasized the Council of Chalcedon, which had condemned monophysitism, which had strongholds in Egypt and Syria, and by tolerating the appointment of monophysites to church offices. The popes reacted by severing ties with the Patriarch of Constantinople who supported these policies. Emperors Justin I rescinded these policies and re-established the union between Constantinople and Rome. After this, Justinian also felt entitled to settle disputes in papal elections, as he did when he favored Vigilius and had his rival Silvrius deported. This newfound unity between East and West did not, however, solve the ongoing disputes in the East. Justinian's policies switched between attempts to force Monophysites to accept the Chalcedonian Creed by persecuting their bishops and monks thereby embittering their sympathizers in Egypt and other provinces and attempts at a compromise that would win over the Monophysites without surrendering the Chalcedonian faith. Such an approach was supported by the Empress Theodora, who favored the Monophysites unreservedly. In the condemnation of the three chapters, three theologians that had opposed Monophysitism before and after the Council of Chalcedon, Justinian tried to win over the opposition. At the Fifth Ecumenical Council, most of the Eastern Church yielded to the Emperor's demands, and Pope Vigilius, who was forcibly brought to Constantinople and besieged at a chapel, finally also gave his assent. However, the condemnation was received unfavorably in the West, where it led to new schism, and failed to reach its goal in the East, as the Monophysites remained unsatisfied all the more bitter for him because during his last years he took an even greater interest in theological matters. Justinian's religious policy reflected the imperial conviction that the unity of the empire presupposed unity of faith, and it appeared to him obvious that this faith could only be the orthodox. Those of a different belief were subjected to persecution, which imperial legislation had affected from the time of Constantius II and which would now vigorously continue. The Codex contained two statutes that decreed the total destruction of paganism, even in private life, these provisions were zealously enforced. Contemporary sources tell of severe persecutions, even of men in high position. The original Academy of Plato had been destroyed by the Roman dictator Sulla in 86 BC. Several centuries later, in 410 AD, a Neoplatonic Academy was established that had no institutional continuity with Plato's Academy, and which served as a center for Neoplatonism and mysticism. It persisted until 529 AD when it was finally closed by Justinian I. Other schools in Constantinople, Antioch, and Alexandria, which were the centers of Justinian's empire, continued. In Asia Minor alone, John of Ephesus was reported to have converted 70,000 pagans. Other peoples also accepted Christianity, the Herali, the Huns dwelling near the Don, the Abascai, and the Zanai in Caucasia. The worship of Ammon at the oasis of Ajala in the Libyan desert was abolished, and so were the remnants of the worship of Isis on the island of Philae, at the first cataract of the Nile. The presbyter Julian and the bishop Longinus conducted a mission among the Nabataeans, and Justinian attempted to strengthen Christianity in Yemen by dispatching a bishop from Egypt. The civil rights of Jews were restricted and their religious privileges threatened. Justinian also interfered in the internal affairs of the synagogue and encouraged the Jews to use the Greek Septuagint in their synagogues in Constantinople. The emperor faced significant opposition from the Samaritans, who resisted conversion to Christianity and were repeatedly in insurrection. He persecuted them with rigorous edicts but could not prevent reprisals towards Christians from taking place in Samaria toward the close of his reign. The consistency of Justinian's policy meant that the Manichaeans too suffered persecution, experiencing both exile and threat of capital punishment. At Constantinople, on one occasion, not a few Manichaeans, 
after strict inquisition, were executed in the emperor's very presence, some by burning, others by drowning. Justinian was a prolific builder, the historian Procopius bears witness to his activities in this area. Under Justinian's patronage the San Vital in Ravenna, which features two famous mosaics representing Justinian and Theodora, was completed. Most notably, he had the Hagia Sophia, originally a basilica-style church that had been burnt down during the Nica riots, splendidly rebuilt according to a completely different ground plan, under the architectural supervision of Isidore of Miletus and Anthemius of Trolleys. According to Pseudocodinus, Justinian stated at the completion of this edifice, Solomon, I have outdone thee. This new cathedral, with its magnificent dome filled with mosaics, remained the center of Eastern Christianity for centuries. Another prominent church in the capital, the Church of the Holy Apostles, which had been in a very poor state near the end of the 5th century, was likewise rebuilt. Works of embellishment were not confined to churches alone, excavations at the site of the Great Palace of Constantinople have yielded several high-quality mosaics dating from Justinian's reign, and a column topped by a bronze statue of Justinian on horseback and dressed in a military costume was erected in the Augustium in Constantinople in 543. Rivalry with other more established patrons from the Constantinopolitan and exiled Roman aristocracy might have enforced Justinian's building activities in the capital as a means of strengthening his dynasty's prestige. Justinian also strengthened the borders of the empire from Africa to the east through the construction of fortifications and ensured Constantinople of its water supply through construction of underground cisterns. To prevent floods from damaging the strategically important border town Dara, an advanced arch dam was built. During his reign the large Sangarius Bridge was built in Bithynia, securing a major military supply route to the east. Furthermore, Justinian restored cities damaged by earthquake or war and built a new city near his place of birth called Justiniana Prima, which was intended to replace Thessalonica as the political and religious center of Illyricum. In Justinian's reign, and partly under his patronage, Byzantine culture produced noteworthy historians, including Procopius and Agathias, and poets such as Paul the Silentiary and Romanus the Melodist flourished. On the other hand, centers of learning such as the Neoplatonic Academy in Athens and the famous law school of Beirut lost their importance during his reign. Despite Justinian's passion for the glorious Roman past, the practice of choosing consuls was allowed to lapse after 541. As was the case under Justinian's predecessors, the empire, 